My name is Cindy Bull Jansons, and along with my partner, John Powell, we're co-hosting today's session. We're joined by two local estate planning experts, Danielle Loop and Noelle Melanson. And we're welcoming the, oh, let's see, there's 41 of you here right now. So thanks for um, giving up some time on this gorgeous day. Um, losing a spouse can be devastating. Uh, whether the death is sudden or whether it's been coming for a long, you know, with an illness for a long time. One day you're married and the next day you're single, no longer a couple and grieving. And trust me, it's really difficult to make decisions during this time period. So the more, the hard fact is the loss of a spouse or a life partner is life changing, no question about it. And that's why we're here today to talk about ways by pre-planning, you could make this time of your life easier. John and I both lost our longtime spouses in early 2019. He was with Noreen for 46 years. I was with Jeff for 40. Noreen was ill for several years and John took over the role of caregiver. I lost Jeff suddenly in just five weeks. He went from shooting his age, 87 mind you, in golf at Pelican Sound to passing 41 days later in Michigan. We learned just then that he had a very complicated blood condition. John and I met later that year and we often discussed the difficulties, uh, challenges that we were confronted with when he became a widower and I became a widow and joined that club that none of us wants to be in. So what we did right and what we did wrong. For example, and the kind of, uh, difficulties and stuff you encounter that you're never thinking about. Upon learning his final diagnosis, Chet was firm that he wanted to go home to his beloved Michigan for his final days. So I had the unanticipated challenge of arranging an air flight from here to Michigan. Uh, two days later, we were ambulance bound from Pagefield, Lee Memorial actually, to Pagefield stuffed in the tiniest little airplane I think I've ever seen uh, with a nurse and an EMT on board and a three-hour flight to Pelston Airport and then to a, another ambulance to a hospice in Petoskey. A week later he was gone but we did manage to fly in all the children and grandchildren so they could say goodbye. Another difficulty took place three weeks later when I went to pay the bill for his memorial reception and was told that my Chase Reserve, you know, star credit card had been canceled. With no notice, bam, I didn't know why or what. Well, it was because he was the sole owner of the card and I was merely a user. And apparently social security notifies the banks, whatever, they were notified that he had passed away and the card was canceled. We don't want these kinds of unfortunate experiences to happen to you. That could have, if we had just known ahead of time that we both weren't owners, we could have avoided that. And while no one will foresee what's going to happen in the future, we can smooth our way. So we're going to begin today with the nuts and bolts, how to plan, both from the financial and legal points of view. First, we will hear from Danielle Lucht, who has been an estate planner for 17 years, specializing in working with retired, especially women. She has won many honors and accreditations, but perhaps her most amazing one, as far as I'm concerned, is that she managed to start her own firm during this pandemic. So she will be fo followed by Noelle and I'll introduce her in a few moments. So I'm gonna pass it over to Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. And thank you for taking time from this beautiful January day. I know you could be out on the golf course or hitting some uh, tennis uh, balls around the court. 
I want to take a moment to say thanks, Cindy, and thank John for having us here today, um, because they are right. It is a very powerful topic that we're talking about today. I think you could hear it in Cindy's voice um, that these issues don't uh, pass very easily. And I think it's important before I delve into my topic for you to understand where um, my my information is coming from. The top three areas where I um, gain new clients each year. First is husbands and wives, where one person has been the primary, what I will say, financial manager of their household. Um, most likely it's the male in most situations, um, but suddenly there's a health event, a health scare, um, or maybe the individual who's been managing their finances for the life of their relationship wants to golf more, wants to tennis, uh, play tennis more, wants to play poker, wants to travel more. They don't want the responsibility of managing the day in, day out life of their finances. Also, more importantly, they want to know, especially in a health scare, that someone is going to take care of their spouse, that they know that there is a plan put in place. The second way I meet most of my clients, um, sadly, is um, I meet them as widows. Um, when they are left to pick up the pieces after a spouse has passed away, whether it's suddenly or after a long illness. Um, and the third area are clients who are moving to Florida and want to make sure that they are properly domiciled and taking advantage of all of the wonderful asset protections that the state of Florida has. So I've prepared a brief presentation to make this a little bit more interactive. Um, you will have contact information for Noelle and myself afterwards. So if you have specifics, please feel free to reach out. Um, but in my segment here, I hope just to ask some thought provoking questions um, in regards to where you are personally and how you can better prepare for the inevitable passing of a spouse. So when we take a look at, let me go full screen here, and hopefully you're all seeing my presentation. What I hope you know, or take time to look at after today, is what happens to the household income when one of you passes away. And I would hope that you would run scenarios, whether it's the husband, whether it's the wife, um, and I use the term husband and wife interchangeably. It could be domestic partners, um, any type of living situation where two people are cohabitating, sharing expenses, to take a look and model out for each one of you what happens to income. Do you keep your social security benefit or do you keep um, the deceased spouse social security benefit. Um, understanding the social social security benefit rules are very important because that is an immediate loss. That is one of the first things that most widows or widows will feel is the loss of a social security value. The second is understanding if um, in our crowd today, we probably have a good portion who are benefiting from pensions. Really important to reevaluate those pension elections. Is it on your life? Is it joint and survivor? Does your survivor take a pay cut upon your passing? Um, do you have any supplemental health benefits that come along with that pension that the surviving spouse or loved one may lose as well? Also taking a look at any other streams of income that you have, whether it's dividend income from investment portfolios, real estate income, you may have business incomes that are still coming out. Modeling out all of these different incomes, if you are still here or if your spouse is still here. Um, and if your current financial planner hasn't done that for you, I would recommend in your next meeting, that be one of the action steps that you want to take with them. Um, because 80% of widows end up very close to poverty because of that first loss of income, that loss of social security income. So making sure you have a plan to replace income is crucial for the surviving spouse. Moving on to what comes with income is lifestyle. How will your lifestyle in, be impacted by the loss of income? A favorite colleague of mine does a presentation called Every Day is a Saturday when she is helping pre-retirees realize what post what retirement life is really going to look at look like and when you think about it in your working years when did you spend most of your money 
Saturday, Sunday. As a mother of a seven-year-old, when do I spend most of my money? Saturday, Sundays, and holidays. Well, when you're retired, we joke, those of us who are still working, every day is a Saturday. Um, and there is a misconception from some that when you go, uh, when you do lose a spouse, that suddenly your expenses are going to be 50% less. Um, and that's actually not the case. Most people will only see a 10 to 20% uh, change in expenses um, from the loss of a spouse. So take a look at your current lifestyle, because my goal working with my clients is making sure that your hopes, your dreams, and the dreams and hopes that your spouse has for you in your golden years and what your family wants to accomplish for you can still happen. So taking a look at your current life costs, do you still have mortgages that you pay? What are your property taxes and insurances? Your HOA dues, golf dues, trail fees, dining expenses at the club. Have I missed any expenses, uh, Cindy, in regards to Pelican <laughs> Sound? Pretty, pretty good. Are you providing support to family members? That could be funding 529 plans for your grandchildren, the Florida prepaid for your grandchildren. Um, are you supporting a son or a daughter's new business? Simple things, electric bill, water, cable, cell phone. So much of this is automated that we forget about what are we actually spending on a monthly basis? What do we have to spend and what do we choose to spend? Um, because there will come a time in the near future, and I know Cindy's looking forward to it, <laughs> of when we can travel again, when we can go see family members, um, when the cruise lines open up, when Europe, Europe opens up. Those days will be here sooner than we realize. And making sure that even when our loved one is not here, we will still want to do and follow the same passions that we had while they were alive. And you, even things like dining out. Um, so take a look and understanding what your lifestyle cost is now and compare that to what will your income be um, should you or your spouse pass first. Um, and I promise you, this may seem like a gloom exercise, but when I have clients walk through these very simple steps, it's first eye-opening, but second, it can be comforting to know that there is a plan. Hopefully there's a plan. Um, see me if there's not. But knowing what life will be like because there is what we call the business of death that has to happen after a spouse passes away. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about next. Is understanding who's on your team. How is your relationship with your current financial advisor, CPA, and attorney? If you're not actively involved in the planning meetings, please get involved. If your team of advisors are older than 60, know their succession. Is it a junior associate? Are they going to sell their book of business? Um, the professionals in the room are chuckling, you might have heard. Um, but it's important to know these people you're going to be relying on in a, in a in a very influential and crisis-like situation, you need to have a strong group of people working for you. You also need a team that's cohesive, that the CPA, the advisor, and the attorney will all work collabor collaboratively together for your benefit. Um, and the number is 75% of widows will find a new team of professionals after their spouse is passing. And the primary reason when I do an intake interview with a new client, the primary reason is the spouse never felt included. Um, so if you don't want to be in this situation, get involved now. Make sure you understand what your income strategy is. Know your asset levels. Know how you're going to generate extra income. Very, very important. You need to be involved now more than ever. Moving on. It's important to, and Noelle will probably touch on this a little bit more, but it's important to review your documents at least every three years. Um, such things as power of attorney. In the financial world, if I have a power of attorney that is older than three years old, there's extra steps that we need to take to make sure that that power of attorney can be honored for whatever transactions we are trying to implement for the clients. Review, and Cindy alluded to this, 
who owns accounts versus who is an authorized signer. Um, I always recommend that we have small bank accounts in each other's names for emergency purposes so that you're not in Cindy's situation where credit cards were in Chet's name, all of a sudden they're alerted to his passing and she's shut off from credit at a very important time in her life. Review your beneficiaries on all accounts. And I say this because we probably have people who are maybe in their second or third marriages or people who are cohabitating together. But review your beneficiaries on all financial instruments that you have. Um, sadly, probably Noel and I could tell you story upon story when we're helping settle estates and uh, there was a divorce and the previous spouse is still on an account. And legally, that previous spouse will get will inherit the account upon that person's passing. There's nothing any court, any child, any attorney can do because it is a beneficiary designated account. Um, so taking a look and understanding who owns your accounts, but more importantly, who are the beneficiaries of those accounts? And also if you've done trust planning over the years and you have amended trusts, making sure that the last amended date is listed on your beneficiary designation is also important and also have cash readily available for um, the surviving spouse due to time delays. Um, sadly, COVID has delayed everything in everyone's life. That includes the processing of death certificates. Um, so I know of someone who's been waiting seven weeks for a death certificate, which in my world means we can't process life insurance claims and there are certain things that cannot happen financially until those death claims are in hand. So once again, that goes back to making sure that there is cash available for whomever the surviving spouse is. I promise you, once you have a plan and know these things, it will feel so much better. Here is my contact information, which you'll also receive in an email afterwards. But another thing I, I think, Cindy, do I have a few more minutes? <laughs> okay. I think what's also important is I know we're talking about the loss of a spouse, but I think we also need to take a look because Cindy and John both had different experiences when they lost their spouse. Cindy was very sudden and tra tragic. John was due to Alzheimer's, correct? No. I'll get into that. Cancer. Oh, cancer. But over a longer period of time, I encourage all clients to have some sort of long-term care plan. And you noticed I mentioned the word plan, not insurance. Making sure that in your legal documents, how do you want your care to be given? Who do you want? Where do you want your care to be given? Um, making these directives ahead of time to give your family guidance, but more importantly, how are you planning to fund that care? Um, especially if we're in second, third, or cohabitating relationships. Um, I've seen situations where um, the couple is not married, um, the children of mom don't want her caring for the new gentleman, don't want her using her assets to care for the new gentleman and have made mom move cross country so that son or daughter can take care of her. It happens more often than we'd all like to admit. Um, and by having a plan in place, legal documents in place, we can move past a lot of these issues if you have a plan put in place. Um, so I want to say thank you for your time today. Um, I look forward to your follow-up questions after our speakers. And I think Cindy is going to take it back now to do our next speak, introduce our next speaker. Yes. Oh, again, um, afterward, after our, our three speakers, um, we're going to open to uh, questions. And at the same time, you are going to be emailed a short evaluation, five or six questions that we really wish you'd take the time to just open up and answer and shoot it back to us while you're listening to the Q&A. So with that said, I want to introduce uh, Noelle Melanson, who also owns her own firm. She earned her law degree from Florida State and uh, currently serves the Florida Bar as a member of the Probate Committee, Guardianship, Power of Attorney, and Advanced Directive Committee and also serves on the bar's probate rules committee. This gal definitely knows the in and outs of planning for end of life legally. Thank you, Noelle.
thank you for that pleasant introduction. And thank you for both for having me here. And I'm really glad that I was able to make this presentation with you. Um, while I was listening to Danielle's presentation, her story of how her clients come to her is pretty much the same as how I get my clients. Um, usually um, it's people who are initially they've met with a financial planner and the financial planner has told them that they need uh, documents in place because they don't have them or their documents are so old or outdated um, that they need to be updated. Um, one thing that I will, uh, before I move on to my portion of the presentation, I didn't have as much time as Danielle to get a pretty uh, slideshow for you, so I apologize for that. But the one thing that I will say that um, meeting with a financial planner is extremely important uh, when you're planning for the loss of a spouse or, or just even if you're single and planning for your future, um, because there's a lot of strategies that you can implement financially uh, which will help you in your retirement years. And one of the ones that uh, she had mentioned was uh, Social Security and how the loss of your Social Security income can impact you. There's also strategies that you can put in place to increase your potential Social Security take. And I use that word very uh, cautiously, but you, you can strategize who takes Social Security first and who takes it second and what age you take it at and things like that. So the importance of talking to a financial planner sooner rather than later um, is important. And for those of you who are on here, this may not apply to you because you may have already made those decisions, but share those conversations with your kids and your kids' friends because um, you, people are losing out on a lot, a lot of financial resources because of that. So, so um, I'll reiterate what um, Danielle said too, the importance of planning ahead of time. Um, the I will start off by saying, if you don't have a plan, the state of Florida has a plan for you. And that does not necessarily be, that might not necessarily be in your very best interests. Um, for instance, if you do not have someone appointed as a power of attorney, the state will appoint a guardian for you. Someone who will be appointed by the state to, or the, the courts to make your decisions. That person might be a relative. It might be somebody that you don't know. Um, so appointing someone, you appointing someone is so much more uh, personal and you get to choose who that person is and you know their um, moral and ethical stand so that you, you're fully aware and, and, and you feel good about who you've appointed. So the important documents um, that my clients, I always, 99% of the time recommend to my clients is a last will and testament, which the last will and testament provides for how your assets are distributed upon your death. Um, and then the remainder of the documents, that's the pretty much the one and only document that distributes your assets at death. Everything else is applicable to the time that you're alive. Um, one of those documents is a living will. Um, for those of you who've been in Florida for any length of time, you may have heard of the Terry Schiavo case, uh, which was a case that occurred many years ago, probably 10 or 15 at this oh, point. It's, it's, it's been a while. Um, but there was a, for her, she did not have a living will. Um, and her husband uh, thought that she wanted one thing. Her parents thought that she wanted something else. Um, and rather than, there, there was no way to make a decision. So the court, they had to intervene with the court. Um, and most of you are probably aware, nothing happens fast in the court. So this poor lady was um, in a hospital uh, with un unconscious and they couldn't decide whether or not her life should be ended ethically or, or she should be kept alive by machines. So your living will is what is the evidence that you present to physicians, relatives, anybody else uh, that will tell you your choices in terms of uh, how you want to be treated in your end stage conditions. Um, another important document is a designation of healthcare surrogate. This is a document that will designate the individual or individuals who you want to make your healthcare decisions in the event that you are incapable or, or not, don't want to make those decisions. Um, Florida has recently passed um, laws which suggest that um, the, this document can be effective immediately, meaning that you do not have to have a determination as to incapacity in order for this document to be effective. Uh, essentially what that means is the physician, the treating EMT, will ask you the questions that they may need answered uh, and ask for directions. And to the extent you're incapable or choose not to answer, they will immediately look to your designated individual um, so that they would make the decisions. And those could be anything from, you know, 
whether or not you um, your leg is repaired if you or amputated, th those kind of things, where you get physical therapy or surgically removal. Um, that's kind of an extreme situation, but you, you, <laughs> you hopefully you understand. Um, the, the next one is, is somewhat important. Um, it's a HIPAA declaration. Uh, the federally, doctors and physicians, anyone in the medical profession is not allowed to disclose any of your uh, confidential medical information to anyone other than you. Uh, your HIPAA declaration is the document that your family members would present to the physician to allow them to discuss your medical condition with them. Um, this does not give them any authority to make decisions, but it does give them access to the information. And that's probably key um, for some of you who may have children in another state who may have to call the physician's office in order to talk to the physician to find out how mom or dad is doing because they're in the hospital. And you know, with COVID and the restrictions we might be under, it's equally important because they might not be able to travel here or they might not get to travel to Florida quick enough. Um, so it's important to designate the people that you wish to have access to that information. Um, the, the, the most important document in my mind um, is the one that I'll talk about next, which is the durable power of attorney. This is the document that essentially gives someone else the ability to, ability to control virtually everything about you. Um, and it's extremely important in my mind because the alternative is, like I discussed before, the court appointing someone to make those decisions for you. Uh, the, the power of attorney agent is extremely, uh, it, it's an extreme, extremely important position, a fiduciary position. Um, and it's, uh, I encourage my clients uh, to actually talk about and think about who they're appointing. A lot of people, a lot of clients will come into my office and say, oh, I'm just going to appoint my oldest child, but she's got financial trouble. Well, maybe you shouldn't appoint your oldest child because if she's got financial trouble, it may be it may incentivize her to potentially not act in your best interests. Um, so you want to be very cautious about who you appoint, and but it is extremely, it's an extremely important document in my mind um, because they are the ones that will make the decision as to whether or not maybe you are in a nursing home or whether you're staying at home. Um, so those are the, the main core documents. And I know Cindy had brought up a, a, a conversation piece that she wanted me to talk about is trusts. Um, and there are, there are some people who will tell you right off the bat, you absolutely need a trust. I'm not one of them. Um, I think that a trusts are an important uh, process. Uh, they're an important document if your situation requires it. Um, I somewhat have a, a kind of, I use a balancing act of sorts to determine whether or not a trust is applicable. It's, it's applicable if you have a specific situation that you need to address that can't be addressed in a last will and testament. For example, a blended family. If you are on a second marriage or a third marriage and you have children from a prior marriage, a trust might be an appropriate avenue so that you could provide for your spouse during his or her lifetime or your domestic partner or whomever um, during their lifetime, but then you want the residuary to go to your children and not their children. Um, so there's, there's different reasons for needing trusts or wanting trusts, um, but it is an available option the misconception that people, a lot of people have is um, people presume that with a trust, you do not need probate. And, and that's a very, it's a very inaccurate statement. And a lot of times it, um, it, it is to the detriment of the client because they believe that um, probate is necessary to clear creditors. Um, and if you, even if you have a trust, if you are the trustee of a trust, you are personally obligated to the creditors of the decedent for two years after their death. So if you have a million dollar trust and you've not cleared creditors and a creditor shows up a year and a half down the road with a multi-million dollar, let's say wrongful death claim against the decedent, the trustee is personally liable to pay that claim if they, up to the extent that they've distributed assets from the trust. So in my firm, we use the probate to reduce the two-year time frame down to 90 days. We can eliminate all the creditors of the decedent within 90 days, and then the trustee is free to distribute the assets in the trust um, right away. They don't have to hold the assets for two years. If they don't want to do a probate, my recommendation always is to wait two years before they distribute the assets. 
Um, I don't know exactly how much time I have left, but there's a few other things that I want to point okay. out. Am I good okay. on time? Okay. Um, so the when you when you've made discussions or are thinking through um, situations, always talk to your loved ones. I don't care um, if it's your domestic partner. I don't care if it's your children. Um, making sure that someone knows your plan. And I know Danielle touched on it as spouses, um, making sure that the, the spouse is involved in the plan. Well, it's also essential to be informed as to not only the financial plan, but the overall estate plan. So if you're in a blended marriage, it's, it's not cool to find out when the first spouse passes that they've not really taken care of you in terms of your financial resources. Um, you know, they may have left uh, insurance policies to a child as opposed to leaving it to the spouse. Uh, they could have left it to the former spouse and then you're trying to, you know, negotiate and, and get that money's back into your possession. So it could leave you in a financial bind. So it's really important to make sure that um, you, you know the plan as well as the medical plan. And I know Danielle touched on it with regard to planning for events in the future, unknown events, um, uh, potentially requiring um, nursing home assistance or uh, you know, in-home health care. Um, those can be extremely expensive. And if you don't know what your spouse or partner wants, and I think John just said he's gonna touch on some of that, uh, but if you don't know what your partner wants, you, you can't advocate for them. And, and that is key. And I have a, um, I did find some stuff to hand out. I have a, a little presentation form. It's not really a presentation form. It's, it's from a, a program called Engage with Grace. Um, and it's a question, um, question answer thing that I, I give to my clients and I tell them to sit down with their spouses first. And most times I encourage them to sit down with their children and maybe their children's spouses and go through these questions um, might take a bottle of wine or two, but I'm uh, dealing with these questions because it's it's essential. Like, for instance, a, a, a huge topic is passing at home versus passing in a hospital situation. Um, you may have very specific desires in terms of how you want, how you see your end of life. But if you've not conveyed that to your partner, like Cindy said earlier, her late husband wanted to die in Michigan. So if, if he had conveyed that to her earlier, they may have been able to make those arrangements at a lower cost <laughs> for sure. And, and, you know, had them situated so that it could have been, you know, a simple one phone call versus, you know, frantically trying to figure out how to make it happen for him. Um, so it's really important that you, you have those conversations. And it, it also, um, I, I explained to people, it, if, if you don't tell them how you feel about those situations, their own emotions are gonna override the situation. So if they have a strong feeling, your fiduciary has a strong feeling that they do not wanna be in a hospital, they're gonna impose that on you. So it's really, that, that I think is the key thing is having those discussions. And we'll, we, uh, Cindy will forward this out to you. Right. So a um, couple other things that I think are pretty, um, pretty important. Um, understanding what your resident state means. Um, a lot of you probably maybe live up north in the wintertime and live in Florida in the summertime, or excuse me, vice versa. <laughs> um, so you, you want to understand what your resident state is and how that impacts your plan. Um, if you are a resident of Florida, your documents are governed by Florida law. Um, so you should have Florida documents. If you are a Michigan resident, then potentially some of your documents might be governed by Michigan law. Um, most states are reciprocal, um, meaning that they will honor the documents as long as they're properly executed. Um, but sometimes the laws in one jurisdiction are not necessarily the same as the laws in Florida. So if you are a at a state resident and you are here more than six months in a day, you probably do want to make sure, and I'm sure Danielle talks about this in her uh, domicile um, presentations, but you probably want to talk about whether or not Florida is the right resident state for you, um, because we do have some really great um, asset protection strategies that you can undertake um, to protect some of your major assets um, here. Um, and, and one of those, and I will touch on that, is your homestead. 
Um, if you are a Florida resident and you live in your primary residence here, um, that primary residence is protected from creditors um, to the, when you pass, it's protected from creditors in that it passes directly to your beneficiaries without any claim of creditors, except for a mortgage holder or a lien holder that may have uh, repaired your roof. Um, that's huge. Um, I, I often tell clients that my understanding is OJ Simpson has a house in Florida for that particular reason. The he Enron has, executives. Yeah, he, he, yeah, the Enron executives. Um, you know, th they can pass that wealth, whether it be a million dollar house or a multi million dollar house, to their heirs without worrying about any kind of claims or judgments that may have been uh, taken on them. Previous. So it's it, that that's one of the strategies that you want to talk to a financial planner or an attorney about to make sure that you're taking advantage of the proper residence if you if you live in Florida and another jurisdiction. Uh, Danielle talked about uh, long-term care planning. Um, that is huge, especially given that we are aging longer. Um, most people are living a lot longer, um, and with that comes the um, implications of aging, <laughs> they stick with us longer. And, and one of the major diseases um, that I deal with, and, and we've talked about this earlier, is dementia. Um, if you're lucky, you can potentially stay at home with dementia, but a lot of people who get dementia require 24 seven care. And um, a lot of times they require locked care so that they, they're not wandering and, and, and harming themselves. Um, that gets very expensive. You can, you can pay, if you're paying out of pocket, uh, up to $10,000, maybe more per month, depending on the services that they're providing and the amenities that the, the, the facility provides. That's a lot of money. And even for somebody who has a million dollars in savings, which, you know, a million dollars used to be a whole lot of money, that's not a lot of money when you're paying $10,000 a month for care. Um, so you want to be extremely, you want to pay attention to your care or to your, to your financial resources and p potentially plan for having a loved one receive public benefits. Um, there are strategies that can be undertaken. So don't hesitate to talk about those things and make those plans well before you need them. Um, Danielle touched on beneficiary designations. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've come in where uh, someone has passed away and the beneficiary designation is their great aunt that passed away 20 years ago. And the problem with that is if, you know, we, we then have to find out how, how to get that to the proper person, which usually means that we have to do an estate administration, again, going back to probate. Um, so it's, it's really key that you make sure that your beneficiary designations are up to date. And that brings me to a point as well. You need to learn and understand what will pass to your beneficiaries inside probate and what will pass outside probate. Um, a lot of people, I, I, in the last six months, I've had a number of things happen where an individual has done this extensive estate plan. They've said, you know, my niece gets 5% and my granddaughter gets 10% and my dog has $10,000 for his or her care for the rest of their life. And then we get to the administration of the estate and we find out that their multi-million dollar um, financial uh, account, which is with a financial planner, has a designated beneficiary and it's the spouse. So all of the people that you wanted to have something don't get anything because the spouse gets everything. And that might not be a bad plan, but it's not what you wanted. So making sure that you understand accounts that have dentist, uh, beneficiary designations, those don't pass through your last will and testament. They don't pass through your trust unless your trust is the owner. And that goes back to understanding who is the owner of the account versus who you might think is a, um, a, a, an authorized user. Um, that another thing I see a lot is safety deposit boxes. And that is, a, you know, that is another key thing where you need to understand who owns the safety deposit box and who's authorized to access the safety deposit box. Um, you know, once someone passes, we can get, we can get access to the safety deposit box, but the issue becomes that everything in that safety deposit box is now inventoried, uh, which somewhat defeats the purpose of the safety deposit box in some people's mind. Um, so if there's $20,000 in cash, then that cash is now taken into the, the estate of the, the decedent versus the spouse having access to that cash immediately. So understanding who owns what is, is extremely important. Um, that is also passwords. 
-hmm. not they, these are not sometimes legal issues, but they're issues that I've seen in my practice that um, could be planned around. Um, knowing your significant other's passwords or having a system in place um, that someone can get access to those passwords. Um, I use the example of my dad. He does not get a statement delivered to him personally via mail. Everything goes to his email. So if he were to pass away and I did not have access to his email, I would not know how much money he had or where it was at. Um, there are systems out there available. Um, my system has a um, somewhat of a pay on death provision for it. So I have an emergency contact that's listed. Um, I have a program that saves all my passwords and upon my death, they will email, someone has to email them to tell them I passed. But as soon as they do within 20 days, if they don't hear from me personally, they will email my password to my, my designated individual so that they can have access to these, um, those important accounts and whatnot. And that includes digital assets. Um, I bring that up because, am I going over? <laughs> okay. okay, so digital assets are another extremely important um, aspect of planning. Um, and digital assets encompasses credit card rewards points, uh, email accounts, Facebook accounts, um, photo sharing accounts, those kind of things. Those are sometimes some of the most sentimentally valuable assets. And without access to them, uh, your, your beneficiaries might not get them. Uh, there's new laws in place every day that are you know, changing, um, trying to provide access to those accounts. But again, it's, it's important that you know of those things so that you know how to deal with them later on. And uh, speaking of credit card rewards, I also encourage people to make sure when they um, are attempting to um, uh, administer an estate, uh, do not do not close out credit cards. People's instinct is to call a credit card company, say, my husband died, um, I need to close the account. Um, once you close that account, they don't ever tell you, wait, you have 100,000 points in rewards. Would you like to retrieve those? No, when you close the account, those rewards go away. So understanding what reward cards, you know, it, it, it's, it's a small thing, but some people use those reward cards for travel and, you know, things like that. So if you're dependent upon those or, or have saved those for specific items, it's really important to, to understand those um, and get with them. Um, so uh, one other thing, I have two more things to do. So uh, funeral planning, um, I encourage clients to plan for their funerals. It's not a legal thing, but it's important to understand what, you're, what you want and conveying that information to someone else. Um, funeral homes are in the process of, or in the, in the business to make money. And uh, sadly, it's, it's a situation where sometimes people don't make the best financial decisions. So to eliminate that for your children or your significant other, making those decisions beforehand and plans is, is important. And it also assists in the spouse's grieving process because they only have to make one phone call. They don't have to meet with funeral homes and try and figure stuff out and you know figure out how you're gonna pay for it and things like that. If you've done all that ahead of time, it's just one less thing for your surviving spouse or partner to, um, to deal with. Um, fiduciaries, um, I know that Danielle talked about you know making sure that your team is got a plan of um, a, a succession plan in place. Um, I also encourage you to have a succession plan in place for fiduciaries. You want to understand their ages, maybe their financial situations or their family situations. You know, um, at the age of most of the people on the program, I presume that you're a little bit older. So your kids, you know, they may not, they might be now appropriate to be your fiduciary, um, but maybe they aren't. Maybe they've got too much on their plate to deal with, you know, managing your finances as well. So understanding their, their situation um, is important and understanding the potential of their situation. And then my final thing, and then I'll pass it over, um, is Danielle said reviewing your estate plan and your documents like once every three years. That, that's a good start, but I also encourage you anytime there is a major event, a birth, a death, a divorce, a marriage, um, a sickness, anytime there is any kind of major event in your life or your fiduciary's lives, 
I encourage you to review your estate plan. Um, I traditionally email or send letters out to clients once a year saying, hey, has anything changed in your life that you might want to consider changing things? Um, because if you're named fiduciary, maybe it's your brother and he got sick or his wife got sick. Um, maybe you don't want to put that pressure on him to be your agent in the event you get sick. Um, so I, I encourage anytime there's a major event, maybe you have specific devices in your estate plan to your grandchild and now you have two. Did you intentionally want to leave that other grandchild out or do you really want to include them? So that's why I, I encourage it. Not, not necessarily every three years. Three years is a good time frame, but also when there's any kind of major event. So I thank you for your time. I hope I didn't bore you. And I hope that if you have any additional questions, you'll give us a call. I'll thank turn it back over to Cindy. <laughs> thank you, Noelle. <laughs> At this point, we're going to bring out Dr. John, finally, uh, of all these women he's been here with. Um, John's going to talk about other end-of-life issues that you might encounter and how to talk about them in advance with each other and with the family. And he comes from academia, was a college professor for most of his career, but he has learned that caregiving has its own challenges. John? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for... Um, visiting with us today, I hope uh, the information that we're passing, I know I found very things that I think I missed in my process as going through this from listening to Danielle and Noel. So what I'm going to try to do now for the next few minutes is, is give you a little historical way in which I think about what they've been talking about from a real position in terms of exactly what was done and what motivates it and how you change it's so critical that this planning begins in a, in a time when, when you and your family, and I don't mean just your spouse, but your family are in a healthy, normal type of lifestyle where you can have a conversation related to the end of life. Some people don't wanna talk about the end of life. Um, others are very free and open to do it. Uh, sometimes you or your spouse or your children may actually be the conversation starter for these kinds of things because it's difficult and not everyone has the same approach. So for me, it, it, it's a little bit different because I, my father, uh, God rest his soul, was a banker for 44 years. And when he retired, he established a variety of financial mechanisms. This was back in the long time ago. But in 1996, when they passed and before they passed, two or three years before that, he called me down to his house in Arizona and he said, we need to plan for what happens to mother and I when we, when we pass. And I sort of awakened my eyes at the point and said, fine, let me know. He said what he would have done was he had inherited some accounts from his sister. He had moved that into his accounts. He put me on as an owner in all of this was in 1996. The laws are a little bit different. He put me on as an owner to on all of all of his assets, all of his um, financial assets, as well as his home and the automobile and things like that. Had put me on as a co-owner. He had worked with an attorney in Phoenix to organize all the necessary paperwork. My wife, his, my mother, and he had. Um, bought an insurance plan, which designated exactly what was to occur at the time of their death re related to whether it was a cremation or a burial. They had it well laid out. They bought this policy 10 or 15 years before this happened. Again, my dad's banking industry and his organizational <laughs> structure did this for him. And so when my mother passed, um, my sister and I went to the funeral home to sort of arrange what they had prepared and said, you know, what do we need to do? And the funeral director said, um, well, here's a, a memory card, pick which one you want. <laughs> and so my sister and I looked, is, is that all? I said, yes, everything else was taken care of. Every, all the designations were completed, all of the beneficiaries, all of the money transferred into my accounts for my distribution, which my sister and I had already agreed upon with my dad. And so that sort of set me on the path. Now, this was in 1996, uh, oddly enough, a long time ago, on um, any scales like a generation. So 
we went on with our lives after that. And, and then in 2005, uh, when, when I turned 60, my wife turned 61, we decided that it was time to maybe start doing some of these conversations that we had never done. We talked about it briefly, but never in an earnest way. And so we decided to sit down and determine what we had to do. Our financial picture was considerably different in those years. We had developed some business relationships that had put some capital in that we didn't normally have. We got into some situations with potential liabilities. And so we decided to consult with a, an attorney I am to go through and find out what's the best way for us to plan ahead. And sat down and actually at that time, and I won't go into the details, it's a legal thing, Noelle's much better than that, but we developed an irrevocable trust for the, for the two of us. She was the, each of us was the beneficiary in the trust and it, it allowed us to plan exactly what we wanted to happen to our assets and the way they were going. And we felt comfortable with that. And so that was in 2005. Another key event for me was, and it was a lucky event, I would have never probably done it on my own because I hadn't thought about it. But uh, the university that I worked for in their benefits program offered us in 2000, I think it was six or seven, I'm not sure exactly when, offered us the plan to, to go with a, an insurance company and buy a long-term care policy. No physicals, no commitment, just call the company, tell them you're an employee of the university and they will set up a plan for you, whatever level you want, minimum level, maximum level. So we bought a plan for each of us at that time, um, knowing that possibly one or the other of us or both of us would need that assistance somewhere in the next, who knows how many years. So we bought that plan. Um, we were all set, felt comfortable. And then along comes um, 2011, my son was injured in the military, great amount of stress in the family at that time. My wife then also was diagnosed with cancer in 2012, two different types of primary cancers. All of the infusions, all the medications and all the materials that went into her care were important to us. They're also very costly, so thank heavens for good insurance at the time. And in this process went on uh, through infusions, through radiation, um, through a variety of different missteps of some medical care, uh, navigating the insurance industry for payments in long-term or term care like that can be very overwhelming. Um, some of the things that you need to do, you don't know you need to do them until the doctor mm -hmm. tells you, that's not my responsibility, that's yours. Um, the, the classic mm -hmm. one is specialty medications. So those are the kinds of things you need to think about in terms of that. How do you navigate through this maze of paperwork from insurance industries and has been pointed out by our esteemed guests, the financial aspects, the legal aspects, there's a mountain of it. And so prior planning, you know, the old, and I've been in athletics all my life, our policy was prior planning presents, prevents poor in performance. And what works on paper never works in the practice and what works in practice never works in the game. So the consequence is you need to be doing some of these things. So with a, a year and a half of treatments, infusions, um, hospitalizations, radiations to deal with the cancers, we thought we were through that and things were quieting down and medications for the next four years, follow-ups, all of those kinds of things led to another diagnosis in 2017 of metastatic breast cancer, which meant, meant now the skeletal system had cancer in it. So more radiation, more treatments, all of these things became very heavy on my wife in terms of the care being provided, the injections, the infusions, the in and out of the hospital, the variations in people, the variations in climates were very difficult for her. And so at that point in time, she went in for a five-year evaluation after the metastatic cancer. The companies, the doctors wanted to know why the cancer wasn't there, wanted to make sure it wasn't anywhere else besides the bone, and found a, a brain aneur a brain condition called white, white matter ischemia, which was causing a de 
degrading memory and mobility situation within her brain. And so over the next uh, couple of months, treatments for the cancer, the doctors finally said, you know, the cancer is not going to be your problem. It's going to be the brain. And so at that point in time, we decided that based on the kinds of things that we were doing that she didn't, my wife said, you know, I don't want more needles. I don't want more infusions. I don't want more MRIs. I don't want more chest x-rays. I don't want any more of that done to me. I'm done with that sort of thing. It was too painful and too uncomfortable. So the doctor said, that's fine because the bone is going to not going to be your problem for a while, but the, the brain injury was. So the next step was to find care. And we chose to go to a local hospice. Local hospice today was something, you know, we all thought of it when we were kids growing up that hospice was if you're within the last six months of your life, you go to hospice. That's not the case anymore today. Hospice is a whole different world today. And what I found when talking with hospice when we decided to do our care at home was that they have clients that are in hospice two or three years before the end of life because they're, they're not in a situation where they have lots of different kinds of medications and surgical things they need. They're in more of a lesser inv involved environment. And hospice is covered by Medicare almost completely. In fact, in, in most cases, it covers all the hospice care. And they get a nurse that comes in every month, checks on everybody, makes sure the medications are okay. And they, at each year, they get it renewed and go right along. So it's not like it used to be. But that kind of palliative care, which is comfort and pain-free, is, is part of what hospice does. And so we went had hospice come, but for the first six months, I took care of her at home. And all of the planning that we had done had started to fall into place because when I needed help, when she couldn't drive anymore, she couldn't go out anymore, she was having difficulty communicating, all of those things came to pass in the sense that I could now call a local home care agency, have someone come in and support her while I went grocery shopping, while I went to the bank, while I went and filled the car up with gas or when I went and got something that she needed or pick up prescriptions because there was a point, it got to a point where I was uncomfortable leaving her alone in the house. And so I had an opportunity to call and lo and behold, after 90 days, the health insurance kicked in uh, and about 60% of all of my healthcare costs from that time on, from hospice time until uh, Noreen's passing uh, six months later, the care policy covered 60% of the costs. Uh, and that made it so much easier because we had planned ahead of time and we had discussed this even during the time of the cancer, during the time when we were talking about the trust, during the time when she was still cognitively organized after we went into hospice, we continually talked about, I know I can remember now her asking me several times, are you okay? Are you gonna be okay? You know, and I, it was very difficult. It's a very emotional time. And, and ultimately when we went into the assisted living, because one day I couldn't care for her anymore. If I would walk into the room to provide food or water or help her with sanitation, she would cry or scream or, or want me not there. So I called hospice right away. The nurse came over, went in and talked to her for a couple of minutes. She came out and she said to me, it's time for, for you now to be husband, not caregiver. And from then on, hospice took over and came in more regularly, helped her, helped the feeding, helped that. And eventually <clears throat> they got to the point where they said, it's time now, you need full-time assisted living. And we went to assisted living. The interesting thing I found in going to assisted living was the cost was extreme, as I think Noel pointed out to you. Um, this was several years ago, but it was it was in excess of $7,000 a month. That's just for assisted living. And I found that insurance doesn't pay for that. My insurance company, which had, up until that time had paid for all of these things, they didn't, they didn't cover any of that. I didn't know that until I called and found out I was going to be on the hook for all of this money. And the trick is if I'd taken, if she needed skilled nursing care, mm -hmm. 
where she needed physical therapy, occupational therapy, or constant medications, or constant uh, pain control medications, insurance has no problem paying for that. Now that was on the order of eleven to twelve thousand dollars a month for skilled nursing. And I had, but the the kicker that blew my mind was that the way to get into skilled nursing to get the insurance company to pay for the services was a three day stay in the hospital. If, if, if she would ever been in the hospital under this care for three days, they would have gone to skilled nursing and insurance would have picked up the whole package. But she didn't need physical therapy. That was, she, did, she needed support. She needed comfort, lifestyle comfort, and pain-free environment. And that's exactly what the hospice program and assisted living provided. Was it the best choice? It seemed at the time. During the planning, I was able to counsel with friends, counsel with um, individuals. Hospice was tremendously helpful in getting me through not so much the knowledge base uh, and being healthcare all my life. I understood the academic side of what was happening to my wife, but I could never imagine the amount of emotional things that that I didn't understand or couldn't control. And hospice was really good at that. So there are a lot of facilities, a lot of support available if you get into a scenario where you need that. But I, I feel very comfortable about that because if we had the opportunity to do just as these ladies have suggested, and that's was sit down and talk logically and reasonably while we were still young, I guess at 60, and plan to move through these events because her mother went through the same thing. She lost two of her sisters to, to disease. And we believe that this was going to be, and it saved our children and our grandchildren a lot of headaches and coming down to it. We planned out what she wanted. She wanted cremation. She wanted this. She wanted that. She wanted a small intimate family reservice. We were able to do all of those things, prepare them all, and have them done in, in a very professional manner. If I, if I look back now, the one key thing that was most difficult for me, and I, I'm sure this is a long-winded story about this, but it, it, it doesn't show what planning can do for you in some very unusual conditions, was during her illness, I had a chance to get away for a couple of days when my sister-in-law came and stayed with her for um, three days while I had a chance to go to a, a local convention and, and sort of get away from this caregiver thing for a couple of days. And people would come to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm sad for you. What can I do for you? It's time for you to move on. You know, these are all kinds of things. It's interesting, but the most important person I ran into was a colleague and he asked how I was doing. And I explained my wife was in, having difficulties. And he said, you know, my wife did that two years ago. And the hour and a half that we spent talking was probably one of the most stabilizing influences in my transgression or transmission through all of these kinds of concerns, because one of the key aspects of planning is being able to have the support around you so that you remember that you need to take care of you in order to mm -hmm. take care of them. And that's, that's the key. In order for you to get through this, you need to be able to take care of yourself and to have the kinds of support and seek support, hospice support, family support, attorneys. All of these individuals have the kinds of emotional training and, and background to be able to give you the support that you need. And so I think those are really good things to think about. Um, and the planning is important, the documentation, you can't say enough about how important that is, but it's also to, to look at it from the humanistic side and say, what, would, what do I want? What do we want? What do our children and what's best for our considerations? So I hope that you've gotten something from this kind of experience from the discussions of our things. And I will turn it back over to uh, um, who's, uh, Aga's doing it. And she will set up a question and answer thing. And I hope that you will take the time, as Cindy pointed out, to fill out that simple evaluation for us. Thank you very much. As you can see, um, we do have a poll. 
uh, here, and uh, you can take it right now as we get situated here. And Aga is going to basically handle the questions. Um, and it's very interesting. One more note while they're getting situated is about hospice. When, when Chet went into hospice, it was a, you know, a building. <laughs> And uh, they were wonderful. They were fantastic. Uh, we did, he was to be evaluated to come home. You know, we had hoped for home hospice. And within a couple of days, he said, I'm not going anywhere. I like it here. <laughs> he had a beautiful view outside. He had a comfortable bed. It was a great big room for the family to visit. And uh, the only thing about cost, and I wasn't sure about that either, is that Medicare did cover all the medically related costs, the nursing and all of that, but we had to pay a daily room and board. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting, but he was only there a week. That was not a major concern, but it's good to know in advance to kind of check this out so that when you're making these decisions, you will be better prepared. Okay, Aga, are you with us? Maybe. Um, I see a question on the side. Cindy, there. could I, could I add something while we're everyone's doing the poll? Sure. Could I, could I add something? Yeah. So we um, didn't have a CPA join us today, but I do think it's important to evaluate um, when the you're at situation. your tax situation um, because married file. Married filing jointly tax brackets are much more generous um, than single individuals. Um, so mm -hmm. some of the widows and widowers that I work with end up finding themselves in a higher tax bracket than they anticipated once um, they're single. But also understanding if you're needing to generate cash or income um, to cover expenses for long-term care, um, understanding highly appreciated stock, whether that should be uh, sold um, for capital gains, if you, you should let that um, take over and pass to a beneficiary such as a spouse with a step up in basis. Um, so part of your end of life planning also needs to be tax planning um, because, because the tax man cometh. And unfortunately, <laughs> the tax man cometh more for single individuals than they do for married individuals. Um, so that has to be a thought process as well, working with, once again, your team of professionals. Um, because I've seen individuals who have liquidated highly appreciated positions like Apple, Amazon, Google, to cover things like nursing homes. So not only did they have to pay significant capital gains, but they also lost a highly appreciated asset where other things could have been sold or liquidated to pay for that care and that asset could have passed more tax efficiently. Um, because the reality is there's an estate tax no matter what your income level is and it's the tax that you pass on to your, um, whether your beneficiaries, your spouse, your children. Um, and the rules for IRAs have recently changed. Um, beneficiaries mm -hmm. used to be able to stretch their RMDs. Now um, IRAs have to be paid out within 10 years after the person's passing. Um, so that could mean a different situation on what assets you leave to children. I recommend for all my clients, I want, especially Florida clients, I want them to spend their IRAs because those are the most tax inefficient vehicles to leave to your children. Um, and I hope you leave things like life insurance policies, um, real estate, and non-retirement investment accounts because those will pass much more tax favorably than uh, retirement, account, retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, 403 bees. And I just wanted to add that. So thank you, Cindy, for letting me add that. I can add something to that as well. Okay. If we want to. Yeah, question. <laughs> um, another thing to consider based on what uh, Danielle just said, um, I know that John talked about how his dad had added his name to certain accounts before he passed. Um, and I, I caution you uh, about doing that uh, without having the proper discussions from the professionals that can give you advice on that. Uh, the implications of the tax implications on that are huge um, because it's considered a gift potentially. And the other issue is you potentially lose your step up in basis 
um, for appreciated assets. Uh, and those, those can have really big tax implications. Um, and the other risk is by adding your name, someone's name to your account, you risk their creditors being able to take those accounts immediately um, before you pass. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of cautionary things and we could probably talk <laughs> about those for hours and hours. Um, you know, so I, I, I suggest you, you contact your professionals. So um, I see we have a question here. Yeah. Does Florida accept the five wishes document? Um, the five wishes document is not a, traditionally executed with the proper execution requirements. Um, what the five wishes document does is it provides your named fiduciary with your wishes. Um, so effectiveness, if your, your fiduciary is going to follow those to the extent they have the ability, but there's no legal enforcement for that actual five wishes document. And secondary, are HIPAA declar declarations valid for all medical personnel and institutions in Florida? Yes, um, that, the, the HIPAA declaration is, is what you need in Florida and, and in actually most, all jurisdictions within the United States because the HIPAA, HIPAA laws are federal, not state specific. Um, so that, that is the document you need for all institutions, including nursing homes um, and, and any you know, emergency facilities, things that provide um, medical services. Are they valid across state? Yes. Um, thought durable power of attorney does not provide any power over health care's issues, just financial. So depending on the intricacies of your durable power of attorney, that will determine exactly how much authority your agent has. Um, traditionally, in, uh, traditionally, I incorporate um, some health provisions but I prioritize the designation of healthcare surrogate. So in other words, I say that in the event there is no healthcare surrogate or there is a conflict between the durable power of attorney and the healthcare surrogate that the healthcare surrogate prevails with regard to medical medical decisions. So you can, you can basically, your, your durable power of attorney can do anything and everything. You have the right to limit or expand on what those provisions are. That I will, I will say that there are a couple things a durable power of attorney can't do for you. They can't get you married and they can't vote for you and they can't perform a personal services contract. So even if you think you're Mariah Carey, you know, you, you can't sing her concert for her if you're her agent. So, <laughs> so okay. Um, I believe that uh, you can raise your hands and if you raise your hands, that's along the bottom of your screen that Aga will recognize you and you can ask your question. Aga, this part does it. You can always type your question yes. in the chat as well. <laughs> you, you can just type your question in the chat and we'll read it there. There we go. So Neil asked a question, was the 2005 trust revocable or irrevocable that you and your wife did? The first one was irrevocable. Oh yeah, right. I think That's we're, right. we're good. We're good. good. <laughs> the first one was irrevocable based on the definition that allowed uh, it to be a contract that is, is stable and can't be altered unless the trustees agree on the alteration between myself and my wife. So she was the, we were the trustees. We could decide if we would have to collectively decide to alter um, the beneficiary, the distribution of assets, et cetera, et cetera. We would have to agree on it, which at the time, 2005, I thought that was cool. And that was fine with us at that time. It, we had our assets put in there, a house and everything but the car in effect. Um, because it helped us to control that and have it prepared for the future. Although when she passed, um, that, that, had, that had to be changed. And I had to reestablish a trust in my name that is a revocable trust. And that allows uh, more flexibility and changing and the, so forth and so on. So, you know, I'll leave Noel to explain it in detail, but you know, it's legal mumbo jumbo for us <laughs> poor guys. But the idea was, it was again, to allow me to be able to distribute the financial resources and so forth, exactly how I wanted them done. It allowed me to develop a special needs trust for my 
uh, grandson who needs special has special needs. So yeah, they are two different kinds, and it's important to know when you're setting it up what they do. So the next one is uh, Roth's IRAs are very tax efficient. Zero tax. I, I think that's more of a statement than a question. Mm -hmm. I, you, you might. Have. So, um, <laughs> he's, he's a financial planner. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, are Danielle and Noel attorneys? Uh, Danielle, Danielle is a financial planner, and I'm an attorney. And then we have a question in the chat box. Um, can you find the HIPAA declaration form online, Noel? Um, I believe there may be a HIPAA declaration online, but I can tell you that every time you go to your physician's office, they have you fill out one. Oh. Um, they, 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 you know, so I, I caution clients when I give them their HIPAA declaration to bring that to their physician, um, because then they don't have to fill out one each and every time they, they go to the office. Okay. Um, Mike McDowell, what is the best way to avoid taxes on IRAs when given to a relative? Can you turn the screen? <laughs> um, there really is no way to avoid paying taxes when you give them to um, relatives. You have delayed paying taxes. You actually took a tax deduction for the amount of money that you put into the plan. It's grown tax deferred um, and the tax man cometh. Now, <laughs> they, he does for all of us at some point in time. Um, the required minimum distributions, which that's what R&D stands for, um, they have raised the ages from 70 and a half to 72. And the calculations are basically done so that by the time the federal government expects you to have passed, you will have repaid all of your taxes back to your local state and federal governments. Um, so the reason why my Florida residents, I encourage them to spend their IRAs down because most likely they are in a um, more cost-effective tax bracket than their children who live in tax-heavy states like New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois, California, um, that not only have state income tax, they may have city taxes, they may have county taxes. Um, so from an efficiency perspective, I have um, clients who have a spend down strategy to purposely spend down IRAs, not just for lifestyle expenses, but for gifting expenses. Um, and then any other assets that they do plan on leaving their children are real estate investment accounts that are not tied to retirement accounts. Um, that's excluding Roths. Um, but most of the clients that I work with um, did not qualify for Roths um, because of the income levels. So while Roths are wonderful, um, <coughs> lot, very few people actually get to take advantage of them because of the um, income limitations, unless they've done Roth conversions. Um, so if you're young enough to take advantage of that, that could be part of how to transfer IRAs to Roth, but you have to be willing to pay the income tax on the money due for the conversion. Um, so a lot of people like to talk about conversions, but when we actually get down to working with the CPA in regards to the tax bill that's going to come with the conversion, they may think very differently about that. Uh, oh, so please type your questions into the Q&A window. Um, it seems that the microphone is not working properly on Aga's computer. Okay, and they did ask, can you find that hip HIPAA declaration form online? Yeah, we covered that. I, okay. I do believe you can find it online. I've never actually Googled it, so I, I don't know. I apologize. You can find everything else. Yeah, online. you probably can. Um, one other thing I would point out, um, and I, none of us touched on this, is understanding um, if you are a married couple, understanding the implications of having lived in or currently living in a community property state. Um, you know, that, that's another key um, to understanding your overall estate plan, I, the, the implications, we, it probably takes another hour to talk about them, but understanding those uh, in your estate plan is also essential um, for purposes of, because you can't necessarily give things away that you don't own. Um, and mm -hmm. in community property states is a co-ownership co style um, estate, so. What are some of the community property states? Oh. There's seven of them, and I can't think of them all off the top of my head. California is one of them. Yeah, I know California is one of them. Uh, and that is, uh, speaking of California, I will tell, also point out that when naming your fiduciary, you really want to consider naming someone other than individuals that live in states that require state taxes. Um, because California, for instance, and she brought that up, 
if your fiduciary, if you have a trust or they are a personal representative in your estate and they are a California resident, California taxes them mm -hmm. on the assets mm -hmm. that are owned by the decedent. So you have to be extremely careful for tax purposes um, because that's a huge, huge impact financially if you've got a, a, a fiduciary that's acting in a state that actually has those kind of rules and laws. So my some God. things that you probably might not think about. <laughs> my daughter's in California. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, that, that's why I go back to understanding who your fiduciaries are and the implications of those fiduciaries because, um, yeah, I think we... Okay. Any other questions? Any more questions? Anybody you type them in here. Otherwise, we're going to close. We've done very well on time. I thank very much all three of our panelists thank you. for the time and effort put into this, and I hope it's useful. We are going to uh, video this. Hopefully, we taped it, and hopefully it will go up on the website so that you can tell others about it, and maybe they'll want to watch. And thank you for supporting Sound Learnings. I'm new on the Sound Learnings Committee, so... Um, I appreciate your attending right now. We have 37. At one point, we had 44 of you still with us. So <laughs> thank you. Have a great day, everyone.